Well, good morning again, everybody, and uh, to our visitors. We're, we're glad to have you guys here. Uh, is it always this chaotic? Absolutely. We wouldn't have it any other way. Um, <laughs> but it's good to be back up here. You guys know that, you know, last week we went to the beach and got in late, and so uh, Brother Zach came and, and filled the pulpit for us, and uh, I thought that was very good. I, I hope that you found it um, to be insightful and informative and, and God-glorifying and all those things, and um, I'm just extremely grateful for Zach and for his friendship and for his ministry um, and his willingness to do that. I wasn't joking when I said Zach teaches the Bible like eight days a week. I mean, that dude is somewhere, I mean, I know he's somewhere right now, but, you know, he's gonna, probably going to be somewhere later teaching the Bible tomorrow and so forth. But anyway, I'm grateful that he came, but I'm also grateful for what he spoke on um, because it ties so well in with what we're going through right now, and especially what we're getting ready to look at this week and next week as we continue today with part number four in our look at the Olivet Discourse. As we're still going through the Gospel of Luke, we're just kind of slowing down here to make sure we do this, this section justice. And I know that we haven't met in a couple of weeks, so I just wanted to give a quick recap, kind of catch us back up to speed, refresh us a little bit on what we've been doing um, through these first three messages. And what we've been doing through those messages is more or less building a context. So in, in other words, for the first three weeks of this look at the Olivet Discourse, we have poured a slap. We've leveled that dude. We've got it measured like the dirt work's done. It's poured. And now we have a foundation, I hope, that we can build our eschatological house on, so to speak. And if you recall in week one, uh, we looked at Matthew 23, and we looked at that promise of judgment that was going to befall the covenant breakers of Israel in their generation within 40 years. And then in week two, we looked at one specific element of that promised judgment, which would be the destruction of that massive, beautiful epicenter of all things Judaism, their temple, right? Jesus pronounced that judgment. He, he tells the scribes and Pharisees, you're going to get hammered. It's going to come on this generation. Then they head to the Mount of Olives, and he predicts the temple's destruction, and that a day was coming where not one stone of this beautiful, majestic building or buildings, not one stone would be left upon another. And then in our third week, which was two Sundays ago, we looked at the disciples' response to these first two, two weeks, these first two events, these things, and we examined the questions that popped into their minds, the things that um, what Jesus told them invoked a response, and so that's what we looked at. And now some people think those questions they asked were three questions. I disagree. I think that's incorrect. I think they asked two questions. Two very straightforward questions. Now, the second one was a combo question, but it was still one question. But when Jesus said the temple was going down, this judgment's coming, temple's going down, they wanted to know, number one, when? When will these things be? Or, or to put it another way, when is this destruction going to happen? You're telling us a day is coming when not. We're looking at this just gigantic building. You're saying it's going down. When? When will these things be? And then secondly, so when is this going to happen? And then number two, what will be the sign of your coming or your parousia and of the end of the age? That's one question, okay? Now, what I really hope that I drove home for you two weeks ago, what I really wanted to make clear was that uh, those first three messages, all three of those things, those events, what's being spoken, they are all interwoven and connected. And, and that is important because the norm today with this section of scripture is to teach it as if these things are not, as if all of this is disconnected. Some of it was for them, some of it's way in our future or whatever. Uh, in other words, the norm today has become to just slice and dice this thing where you can just arbitrarily do whatever you want with Jesus' words, with the disciples' words, but, but we can't do that. That is not the case if we're gonna be faithful expositors of the word of God. The, the parousia and the end of the age, both of these things in the minds of the disciples are synonymous events. That's why they ask the question they do. In other words, the parousia, or remember we talked about the arrival of Christ into his kingdom is what marks the end of the age. They're synonymous events. And what age was that? Y'all remember? It was the old covenant mosaic age, the age they were living in, the age that is for them. You see, in their minds, Whenever Jesus was going to bring this Matthew 23 judgment upon apostate Israel with the destruction of that temple, that event, that destruction marks the shift that occurred, or, or it would mark the, that the shift had occurred and that the Mosaic age would be no more and the Messianic age would then continue on by itself forever. 
So they're in the age it is, temple goes down, now we're in the Messianic age. And that's how they understood it. And that's why they asked the questions that they asked. So that's what we've been talking about. And with all that in mind, what I want us to do over the next several weeks is to be able to stand on that foundation and to look at Jesus' predictions, because he's fixing to tell them a whole bunch of stuff is going to happen between now and that event. And I want to show you these predictions and how they were fulfilled in history just like he said they would be. Um, Because here's the thing. I've laid my cards on the table. You know my position. And if I'm going to stand here and I'm going to tell you that every bit of the Olivet Discourse has a first century context and fulfillment, then and, and that it really did come upon their generation, just like Jesus said, I better be able to prove that, right? I better be able to show you why that is so and why I believe that. And so that's exactly what I'm going to seek to do. And in doing so, in in showing you all that, we're also going to answer their first question. Uh, In other words, when is this age-ending, temple-destroying, judgment-bringing, kingdom-instituting, parousia event going to happen? When is this going to happen? And and what's interesting about Jesus' reply to their question is that before he gives them the sign or the win or the thing to look for that would tell them, like, hey, this is the time my parousia has come, before all that, He gives them a whole bunch of stuff, a bunch of signs that must first take place leading up to that point. So that's what we're going to begin to look at this morning. So with all that in mind, as we always do, would you please stand with me this morning? And we will look at, we're actually going to look at the text that's on the back of your bulletin like we've done every week um, from Luke 21, Mark 13, and Matthew 24. So this is a lot, bear with me. So starting in Luke's reading, Luke 21, 8 through 11, and he said, see that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place. But the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places, famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Uh, Mark's reading, Mark 13, 5 through 8. And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray, and many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Then there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines, but these are the beginning of the birth pains. And then Matthew 24, verses 4 through 8. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you now and ask, uh, God, as always, that you would give us understanding. Lord, that you would illuminate the text for us. Uh, God, help us to just come to know you greater through this, through your word. Lord, help us to understand um, specifically who these words were for um, in their context. God, what they meant to the disciples. And and most of all, uh, Lord, help us to understand what you would have us do in light of that. Uh, In light of these things, how, how would you have your church go forth? God, help us to see you greater today and give you the glory that you deserve. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so that was a lot of text, right? But here here at the beginning of our Lord's reply, to summarize it, we see him give basically several bullet points of signs. We could basically break it down like this. He says there's going to be false Christ, there's going to be wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Now, what he is not saying in the text is that these things are the sign of the end. And we need to understand that more so today than probably ever in the history of the church. Okay, the the things that we are looking at this morning are signs that would occur leading up to the end. They are not the signs of the end. Jesus is telling the disciples that before his parousia and before the end of the age, they're going to start seeing all this stuff happen. Uh, But but later on, uh, which we'll get to, he's going to give them a specific time sign or two that will tell them, that will show them that it is, in fact, the time of the end. But these signs are not that that sign, okay? These are the ones that will lead up to that. So what I want to do this morning is just examine these things one by one because he said they're going to happen, right? And I want to show you in history where they did. So 
the first thing he tells the disciples here is that there's gonna be false Christ, false messiahs, uh, in other words. In all three gospels, he tells the disciples there are people coming, there are people coming who would say, I am he, or as Matthew puts it, I am the Christ, I am the Messiah. And he tells them to not be led astray. So how many of you have seen the crazies on TV that are claiming to be the Messiah or claiming to be Jesus Christ? I know y'all are from Arkansas, you've seen cops, okay? We've seen them find some crazy like shirtless man in the bushes who claims he's Jesus. They're, they're all over the place and they pretty much have been for at least all of our lives. And most of these guys pretty much go undetected, right? We, we don't see or hear, I mean, the vast majority of them. But every now and then, one of these guys will actually build somewhat of a following. And this is something that people in our generation, in an age of dispensational premillennialism, yeah, I said it, people will look at these guys and they'll think, oh, there's a false Messiah. The end is near, right? It, it's on us. Jesus said to look for that. So one that we may have heard of, for example, in history is David Koresh. How many of y'all have heard of David Koresh? Anybody in here know the name? Yeah, a few of us. If you don't know who he is, look him up. And some of the crazy stuff that happened in Waco during the early 90s surrounding this guy. He, he was a false messiah. But the question is, is David Koresh or these guys on cops or, or any of these other yahoos that, that, that have been running around all these years claiming to be the messiah, are these people who Jesus has in mind as he's speaking to his disciples right here? No. No, they're not. Remember the principle of audience relevance. We've been talking about this. Who is being spoken to? How would they have understood his words? Uh, Jesus is telling these first century disciples, and remember, all this is, he's telling them it's gonna happen within the context of a generation. He's talking to these disciples, and he's telling them, he's telling them that many false Christs are coming, and he's telling them to not be led astray, right? He does not tell them. This is not what Jesus says. Hey, you guys reading this in Jonesboro, Arkansas, 2,000 years after I say this, keep an eye out for these false Christs. That's not what he says, which is not to say that we don't have application from this. It's not to say this text is not relevant to us in some way. But my point is, the warning Jesus gives is specifically to and for these first century disciples. And this is very similar to what he told them back in Luke 17, talking about the kingdom of God. If you've got a handout, I put this on there, but if you remember back when we were in Luke 17, the Pharisees are asking him about the kingdom of God. And they're basically asking him, when's it gonna come? They're like, okay, you're claiming to be the Messiah. You're claiming to bring in the kingdom of God. Well, when's it gonna happen? And if y'all remember in that conversation, Jesus tells them, well, it's coming in ways that can't be observed. You're not gonna be able to see it. You know, it's within, it's in toast. But look at what he says in verse 23. He says, and they will say to you, look here or look there, but do not go out and follow them. Look here, look there, but don't go follow them. Who was he predicting would be running around saying the kingdom had arrived? False messiahs, false Christ. It's the same thing. That These would be imposters that were claiming to be the Messiah and claiming that they had brought the kingdom of God with them. Or as he puts it here in Luke 21, they would be telling them the time is at hand, right? They, they brought it with them. So the question to ask then is this. If he's speaking here around AD 30, right, about things that would happen within a generation, within 40 years, does history record for us that there were in fact false Christs on the scene between 30 and 70 AD? And the, yeah, some of y'all are nodding. And the answer is yes, absolutely it does. That Bible that you're holding in your hands this morning has a book in it called Acts. We're going through it in Sunday school right now. And in chapter eight of the book of Acts, if you look at verses nine and 10, it says this, but there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest saying, here's what they're saying about Simon. This man is the power of God that is called great. So this Simon guy was saying that he was somebody great. Well, what does that mean? I mean, LeBron James says he's somebody great. That doesn't mean he's a false messiah, right? Well, according to Irenaeus, this Simon claimed himself to be the son of God and the creator of angels. And Justin Martyr, uh, speaking about the same guy, he records that almost all the Samaritans of their day, they considered Simon to be the highest God. So church, if you're claiming to be the son of God and you're claiming to have created angels and everybody in your circle thinks you're the highest God, 
you're claiming to be the Messiah. You're claiming to be the promised one. So there's, there's one. Josephus records about a man named Theudas. And listen, there's a lot of stuff in here. I'm from Harrisburg. I'm going to pronounce it wrong, all right? But you don't know how to pronounce it either. So we're, we're on the level playing field. But he says this. It came to pass while Thaddeus was procurator of Judea that a certain charlatan whose name was Theudas persuaded a great part of the people to take their effects with them and follow him to the river Jordan. For he told them that he was a prophet and that he would, by his own command, divide the river and afford them an easy passage over. So this Theudas cat convinces all these people to follow him to the Jordan River. Uh, he's, he's telling them all this stuff. And one commentator speaking about him he writes this, and all this is on that paper I gave you, but he writes this, Theudas certainly claimed to be the Messiah. Theudas uh, claimed to be able to divide the river is a clear allusion to Joshua 3, verses 14 through 17, which has everything to do with the redemption of Israel. So there are a couple examples. There are a couple false Christs, but check this out for more of what Josephus records. He says this, Now the affairs of the Jews grew continually worse and worse, for the country was full of bandits and impostors who deluded the crowds. Yet every day, Felix, the procurator of Judea from 52 to 60, he captured many of these impostors as well as the bandits and he put them to death every day. He then goes on to write how these impostors that, that he's talking about, Felix putting to death every day, how they were charlatans who were trying to lure people into the wilderness to show them wonders and signs from God. So... Here's what that means. There were so many false messiahs during that time that Felix was putting together, or putting to death, rather, false messiahs daily. Daily. So Jesus predicts here that within their generation there would be false messiahs, and guess what history records for us? There were false messiahs. So Jesus is batting one for one right now. Next prediction. Uh, Jesus says there's going to be wars or tumults, so think chaos, think disorder, commotions. I think New King James translates it translates it as commotions. He says there will be rumors of wars, nation against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And this one's my favorite one. It really is, because literally anytime, in, and we've all got Facebook, we see this, anytime anything in the world happens that's war-related, what do you see? People start sharing Matthew 24, like the, the, Russia invades Ukraine. Oh, wars and rumors of wars. The end is near. Uh, everybody knows it, which is really interesting to me because if you go back and read the text, Jesus explicitly tells them in the Gospels that when these things start happening, the end is not yet. So he literally says, these are not the signs of the end, but everybody today is like, oh, there's a war, the end's coming, but I digress. Let me ask you guys a question. Is there a single person in this room who, who can remember a time in your life when somebody in the world was not at war with somebody in the world? Not a chance. Um, I was actually going to make a list for y'all and list some out, put it in that handout. And then you know what I figured out? There are too many. Like there's literally wars forever. So do this instead. When you're eating lunch today, just Google it. Wars by year. And just scroll and just read. And what you'll see is that somebody has been bombing, shooting, stabbing, invading. I mean, whatever. You name it. Somebody else for what seems like forever with one exception. When Jesus gave this prediction to the disciples, they were living, uh, is again, around circa 30 AD, right? They were living in a time period known as the Pax Romana or the Roman peace, the peace of Rome. And the, the Pax Romana was considered a time period of relative tranquility. Uh, sometimes it's known as the golden age of Rome. And, and here's the deal. By 27 BC, the Roman Empire was in full swing. Like they'd come in and conquered uh, a ton of people and so when they took over and were established, there really weren't any significant wars to speak of for a really, really long time, uh, namely in their day. I mean, there was an uprising here and there, but for the most part, it just wasn't happening. Now, obviously, in their day, there was a lot of resentment toward Rome. Like, people hated Rome because they conquered them, right? They come in and took their land over. But here's the deal. In Rome's eyes, if they conquered you, like, as long as you were willing to submit to Roman taxation and you were willing to play by their rules— they would more or less leave these people to govern themselves. I mean, they left the Jews to themselves for the most part, as long as they checked the boxes, right? So as a result of all that, all that being said, what happened during this time period, it, it was just a time of unreal peace and economic prosperity. 
for the Roman Empire. Like things were good. Things were better probably than they've ever been for any nation. So here's the deal. For you and me to hear of wars and rumors of wars, that is not anything unusual. That's been happening forever, and it probably always will. But for them, that would have been significant. Uh, if you're living in a time where it's mostly peaceful, right, and there's not just a whole lot going on, and then you start hearing of wars popping up all over the place, well, guess what? That's not normal. Uh, that's unusual. That ought to start making your ears perk up a little bit. Well, guess what happened after Jesus ascended? History records that wars, commotions, tumults, whatever word you want to use, they started popping up all over the place. Um, here are a few headlines from the, just the early 60s, okay? 60 AD, we see the Brightons revolt under Queen Boudica. 160,000 Romans and Brightons are slain. 62 AD, Vol Vologeses, king of the Parthians, defeats the Romans who temporarily lose Armenia. 63, war with the Parthians resumes. 64, gladiators revolt in the town of Praeneste. Praeneste. Now, there's just a few from, from the 60s, right? In the annals of Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, you can read about the following events leading up to AD 70. From, from 30 to 70, here are some from Tacitus. He writes of disturbances in Germany, commotions in Africa, commotions in Thrace, insurrections in Gaul, intrigues among the Parthians, the war in Britain, and the war in Armenia. War all over the place. History also records that it wasn't just these far-off nations. The Jews had trouble too. Uh, Caligula, who ruled from 37 to 41, he had actually ordered that the Jews put his statue in the Roman temple. And they said, no, like we're not doing that. We don't care who you are. And so as a result of that, the Jews were so afraid that Caligula would come in and invade them and kill them all that they didn't even till their fields one year um, because they were so afraid. And we also read of other battles with the Jews where 50,000 were killed, 20,000 were killed, and so forth. I say all that to say Jesus told the disciples, you know, in this, in this generation, in this time period, there are going to be wars. There's going to be commotions. There's going to be nation against nation. All this stuff happening, and history shows that he was right yet again. So Jesus is two for two. Now, the next thing he lists is that there will be famines and pestilences. Now, if you're not familiar with the word pestilence, it basically means fatal disease. So think like an epidemic, uh, something, a disease that will spread, a sickness that will kill a lot of people. So what Jesus is telling them is in this time period, there's going to be extreme hunger and extreme sickness, right? But leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Look at Acts 11 um, with me and look at verses 28 through 29. It says, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the spirit that there would be a what? Great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. So what we see here in Acts 11 is this prophet predicted a great famine to come. And Luke, in the parentheses, he gives us a little note there. And he tells us that this famine happened in the days of Claudius. And listen to this guy's full name, Claudius. His name was Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. I love it. If we have another boy, we're doing that with drum at the end of it. But uh, Claudius was the emperor of Rome from 41 to 54 AD. So Luke tells us this, this famine that this prophet predicted, it happened during this time period. It happened during Claudius' rule. Well, guess what history tells us? In the year 45, the Nile River flooded, and it basically uh, almost wiped out the Egyptian grain harvest for the year, which resulted in a severe famine that struck Judea from 46 to 48. Two years of really bad famine. This famine was so bad that it was written about by Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, and Eusebius, four historians. And of course, there were other famines as well, because again, let's go back to the wars, right? Everybody just started killing each other. Well, part of the war, part of the, the strategy was to go in and eliminate the food supply. So when all these battles start popping off, guess what came with them? Famines. Famines everywhere. It was common. Um, well, what about pestilences? Where do we see this play out? Remember the famine we just looked at in Acts 11 and we said that came to pass in the mid-40s? Uh, well, Suetonius writes this. He says a pestilence at the same time, same time as that famine, okay, a pestilence raged in Babylonia, and multitudes of Jews on account of it withdrew to Seleucia. So there's your pestilence. And this is just a side note, but remember when we were reading Luke's gospel here, Luke 21, 
Um, he adds that there will be great terrors and signs from heaven. These things. Well, Suetonius records in history that during this famine and during this pestilence, a comet was visible in the sky while all this was going on. We might call that a sign from heaven, right? You think that's a coincidence? I don't. Tacitus records for us that 53 and 54 AD, as Nero began to take over, as Nero began to rule, this was a time period marked by famines. They were everywhere and pestilences as well as comets in the sky. So they were seeing these things. And on top of that, there was a Roman author named Pliny. I love that name. Pliny the Elder, who also recorded a phenomenon during this time. He said there were three suns in the sky. Um, and other people testified to this. Now, he obviously realized that there weren't three suns, or, or the other two were not the actual sun. But nonetheless, this was a strange natural phenomenon that they couldn't explain, that they saw in the heavens, right? A sign in the heavens. So... We see all these things here. We see pestilences, but one in particular that was recorded was really, really bad, and it came, um, it hit Rome in the autumn of 65, and it resulted in the death of 30,000 people during that time period. So as you can see, history records that there were famines, there were pestilences, and there were signs from heaven, once again in their generation, leading up to the events of AD 70. So what's Jesus for now? Three for three or four for four, however you want to slice it, he's still perfect. Now, let's look at his last prediction that we're going to tackle this morning, which is earthquakes, okay? And I bet at this point you're willing to bet the farm that there were earthquakes, and you would be right in doing so. In 58, a Roman historian named Seneca, he wrote this, speaking of a result of the local earthquakes. Listen to this. This is amazing. He said, how often have cities of Asia and Achaia fallen with one fatal shock? How many cities have been swallowed up in Syria? How many in Macedonia? How often has Cyprus been wasted by this calamity? How often has Paphos become a ruin? News has often been brought us of the demolition of whole cities at once. So these weren't mild earthquakes, were they? This was mass destruction, um, according to Seneca. As a matter of fact, here's a list of some other cities that experienced earthquakes during that specific 40-year time period. You have Hierapolis, Colossae, Laodicea, Crete, Apamea, Smyrna, Miletus, Chios, Samos, and Judea. That's a bunch of earthquakes. And if all that isn't good enough for you, turn in your Bible to Acts 16, and we'll look at one more. Acts 16, verses 25 and 26 says this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. That's right so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. So Jesus said that there would be earthquakes, and there were earthquakes. There were a bunch of earthquakes. So we see our Lord is still batting a 1,000, right? He's still perfect. So all these things happen just like he said they would happen. And as we begin to close this morning, I want to draw your attention to something. Because in our day and age, most Christians will apply these events, they will take these things and apply them to what's happening in our world today. In our day and age, and they will say, see, there's wars, there's famines, whatever. The time is near, right? The end is near. But never mind the fact that, once again, these were warnings for these first century disciples. But even if they did, even if they did apply to us today, Jesus explicitly says in all three that when these things start taking place, the end is not yet. These are not signs of the end. They are signs leading up to the end. And what I want to point out to you is something that Luke leaves out that Matthew and Mark both include. And what I'm talking about is Jesus reiterating the fact that these were not signs of the end when he says this, all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. So rather than being the end, Jesus says these are signs of the beginning. Well, if these are signs of the beginning, why is everybody running around freaking out every time there's an earthquake or a new sickness or a bad drought or whatever it is? Why do people in our world lose their minds when Jesus was crystal clear? I think it's because for so long we have misapplied Christ's words and we have tried to make this about us and it's just not. It was to them, it was about them. He told them these things are the beginning. They are the beginning of the birth pains. Now, one thing I love about this place, about New Heritage Church, is that we've got a bunch of babies running around. We've got little ones all over the place. Um, I got tickled in Sunday school because there were like four of them at one time just, ah, you know, 
we've added two this year. We've got another one on the way. Um, I don't know if y'all have realized this yet, adults, but we're almost outnumbered here, and we're well on our way to that. But you can't listen to anything we record without hearing kids, like screaming and dropping toys, and you can't be up here leading music without laughing at them because they run around like wild cats. Um, and I love it. Th these kids are a blessing. They are a blessing, and, and I pray for them often, and I pray for you and us and all of us that God would bless us in raising them. But the reason that I bring that up is because many of you here have either experienced or been alongside somebody, seen it. We've been a part of birth pains, right? We understand this. We, we get how this works. When the con contractions start, like when baby's on the way, it's, it's minor. You know, they're every now and then, there's some discomfort. But then as it gets closer to time, what do the contractions do? They progress into full-blown mayhem. Um, I remember being, when we were pregnant with Samuel, we're at my dad's house, and Kenna starts contracting, and she's timing them, and, you know, everything's cool. And then by the time we got home, she was, like, leaned over the couch like this and, and couldn't talk to me. Um, they had got severe because it was close. Well, these birth pains are an analogy that are used by God in the Old Testament to express what we'll call a less than desirable period of time. Okay, it's a period of labor, period of suffering, and so forth. And I'll give you one example, which we're actually going to look at again in a few weeks for a different reason. Um, we'll get there when we do, but it's Isaiah 13. And we see a prophecy against Babylon. And in Isaiah 13, 8, we read this. And they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. If you read the text around that verse, the context of Isaiah 13, what you would find is that this is straight up not a good time for Babylon, uh, okay? This was going to be a time of pain, sorrow, and for them, their ultimate destruction. But Isaiah, he, he plays off that birth pains analogy further down the road in Isaiah 26, in the middle of his little apocalypse, as it's known. Um, Isaiah 26, 17, and 18 say this, like a pregnant woman who rides and cries out in her pains because she is near to giving birth. So were we because of you, O Lord. We were pregnant, we writhed, but we have given birth to wind. We have accomplished no deliverance in the earth, and the inhabitants of the world have not fallen. So these Israelites have gone through hardship, right? They've experienced this time of sorrow. They've experienced the pain of childbirth in this analogy, but they wound up empty. Um, it, it says there that we have given birth to win. We have no deliverance, uh, right? So this is not good. Well, what's the point that's being communicated? Well, it's just that. It's that they've accomplished no deliverance in the earth. They've not been delivered. But look at the next few verses, which is a prophecy of something to come. Uh, Isaiah 26, 19 through 21. It says this, Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. There's a birth. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is passed. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. I know that's a lot, but last week we looked at Isaiah's little apocalypse in chapter 27. And I made a case for you that in Isaiah 27, talking about the end, uh, when the stones will be crushed like chalk stone and this and that, that that was not about the end of the world. That's not what Isaiah's little apocalypse is about. But the end he had in mind was the end of old covenant Israel, uh, the old Testament, the old age, right in AD 70 with the destruction of the temple and the shattering of the power of the holy people. Well, guess what? Chapter 26 and chapter 27 go together. They actually start, Isaiah's little apocalypse starts in chapter 24. And th just go read that. Go read Isaiah 24 through 27 with AD 70 in mind. And it's amazing. But I say all that to say, this means that what, what's going on, what's being talked about here in 26, is not a promise about the end of the world. It's a promise that's pointing to AD 70 as well. And it makes perfect sense. And I'll tell you why. Because verses 19 through 21 are a contrast with the ones that came right before it. Remember, it was an empty birth. Uh, they said, we've given birth to the wind. We, we have no deliverance. Well, this is a prediction of another time of birth, which would result in resurrection, judgment, and deliverance. So with that in mind, Jesus tells the disciples here 
that all this stuff, all these signs they're about to see are the beginning of the birth pains. This is going to mark the beginning of a time of anguish and pain and great sorrow for the disciples of Jesus Christ. And I contend to you this morning that this particular set of birth pains, Jesus is telling them, you're getting ready to enter into, these are the ones of Isaiah 26 that would ultimately result in a birth of resurrection, judgment, and deliverance. And this is why what Zach talked about Sunday night is so important. It's important that we understand this because these first century disciples, these guys Jesus is speaking to, they're about to go through the ringer. Next week, we're gonna look at Jesus tell them, he tells them point blank, you're gonna be beat to death. You're gonna be flogged. You're gonna be put to death. They're fixing to go through all this. And Zach showed us example after example, didn't he? Of persecution, first century persecution where the Jews uh, were persecuting the church. It's all over the place. And you know what that persecution is? It's the birth pangs. It's part of the birth pangs. It's part of that time period where they're awaiting the birth, um, which ultimately results in their deliverance. Now, this whole talk about the birth and their deliverance and all that, this takes us back to the two age thing that we talked about two Sundays ago. I hope y'all remember that, but they were living in the Mosaic age, right? And they were anticipating the Messianic age. They were anticipating the age of Messiah. Well, listen to this quote from William Barclay. And I'll just tell you as a side note, this is not a guy I would recommend you get your theology from, okay? He believes some wonky stuff. But Barclay was a really good historian, okay? And he's got some good material as far as it pertains to that. But Barclay writes this, time was divided by the Jews into two great periods, the present age and the age to come. The present age is wholly bad and beyond all hope of human reformation. It can be mended only by the direct intervention of God. When God does intervene, the golden age, the age to come, will arrive. Listen to this. He says, but in between the two ages, there will come the day of the Lord, which will be a time of terrible and fearful upheaval like the birth pangs of a new age. Let me show you one more thing this morning and then we'll button it up. Barclay says, he's a historian, he, he knew Jewish stuff, okay? He says that the day of the Lord would be between the two ages. In other words, the day of the Lord would mark the transition. That's what I've been talking about up here. It would mark the transition from the Mosaic age to the Messianic age. Well, the question we need to answer, if that happens in, in between, when does the day of the Lord happen? If it's in our future or when did it happen? When did the day of the Lord happen? And here's the thing. If you go read Joel and you go read Acts, what you'll find is that Joel says the day of the Lord happens after the last days. It happens at the end of the last days. Well, according to Peter in Acts chapter 2, he applies Joel's prophecy to 2,000 years later. No, he applies Joel's prophecy to them, their generation. He says they were living in the last days, which must mean that the day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is not this far off thing uh, there in the last days. There's not a chance of that. Micah 4 is a prophecy about the Lord coming to establish his kingdom in the last days. I think it's Micah 4 verse 1. He says that, but you know what you find in verses 9 and 10? So we're talking about uh, in the last days, God's going to establish his kingdom in verses 9 and 10. It reads this. Now, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished? Has pain seized you like a woman in labor? Writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. So in the last days and the establishing of God's kingdom, you know what we see? A reference to birth pains that end with redemption and rescue. So the question becomes then, if Jesus is telling these disciples, that they're about to go through this time of labor, that they're at the beginning of it, right? They're at the beginning of these birth pains. They're about to go through all this, and it's gonna result in this new birth. And if he's tying in, and I believe he is, if Jesus is alluding to all these Old Testament texts that point to the same event, shouldn't we see this understanding somewhere in our New Testament? Like, wouldn't one of the New Testament writers understood the time they were living in? They would have understood they were in the middle of those birth pangs and like the birth was about to come. They were about to be delivered. Um, that's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked it. Yes, we do see that. Um, Zach touched on this when he was here last week, but Paul in Romans 8, and this is long. If you've got it there in front of you, read this with me. 
Romans 8, 18 through 25, he writes this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is, Greek word mellow, about to, the glory that is about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly, or we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now I know that's a lot, okay? But Paul understood the time he was living in. That's the point of that. He understood that he was in that already not yet transition period, which would end with the fullness of adoption, with the fullness of redemption and the revealing of the true sons of God. And he also understood that this birth, this, you know, they were in the pangs leading to the birth. He understood that it was close. Paul said the glory he was waiting for was about to be revealed. It was soon. This was not some far off thing. Christ's words were spoken to his first century disciples, and they were fulfilled with 100% accuracy, accuracy exactly as he predicted. And Paul understood that. Is it not awesome to see all this? I know it's boring. You just fact, date, right, quote. But is it not awesome to just step back and think, like Jesus said all this stuff was going to happen, and then it did. I mean, it's crazy. And, And not only that, but God was sovereign enough that he had men record these events. They didn't have TV back then. They didn't have an iPhone. But they wrote these things down, didn't they? And now we have record of them, and we see our Lord's words vindicated. He was spot on with everything that he said. So what do we do with this? I know I said I'm closing once. I'm really closing this time, okay? What do we do with this today? Well, the first thing we do is we understand that whenever we see a war on TV or we hear of an earthquake or whatever it is, that we shouldn't be alarmed, okay? We shouldn't go crazy, because these prophetic warnings were given to these disciples and they were fulfilled 2,000 years ago, exactly as Christ said they would be. These things are not signs for us today that the end is near. Uh, They are not signs that we're living in the last days. Friends, the last days came and the last days went, as did the end, because the only end Scripture ever points to is the end of that old covenant mosaic age, which ushers in one last time the age to come the age of Messiah. And that's really where I want to land today um, because we are living in that age. We are living in the age to come. We're in this messianic age that they were all longing for, that they were all looking for. It was the hope of Israel. We have it now. We're in it. So what that means is that when we see Paul talking about these things he hopes for, and Peter, we looked at Peter this morning, uh, eagerly longing, waiting for these things, we don't have to do that. We don't have to long and wait and hope for these things. They're already ours. We don't have to hope for the fullness of adoption, church. We have it. We don't have to hope and wait for the fullness of redemption. It's already ours. As followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are the true children of God, and therefore, we lack nothing spiritually. We're in perfect right standing with God, and nothing can ever change that. Nothing can remove us from that position. To quote Pastor David Curtis, he says this, you don't hope for what you have. People talk about all the time, you're ruining my blessed hope. Well, how? Explain that, because from my point of view, it's pretty good. Uh, We've got it. I'm not waiting for anything, right? Waiting to die and go to heaven, but that's it. Everything else is done. So you don't hope for what you have. And you and I, as Christians, we have salvation, full salvation, complete redemption, adoption, all these things through the repentant faith that God gives to his elect. And what a blessing that is. Uh, What a cause to praise him this morning. Let's pray.